Okay, great. Uh, Okay, so if you're following this like you usually follow a lecture, you think we're done proving the proposition because I showed that up to semi-conjugacy, uh, A is hyperbolic. Right? But there's sort of a, a trick here, uh, an annoying hang-up, right? I said that like just the restriction of rho to these two things is semi-conjugate to a geometric picture. That semi-conjugacy might, doesn't, doesn't need to, that might, might not play well with the rest of the action. Right? There's, I can't necessarily, if I, if I know to collapse some intervals that are invariant under this sub subgroup, they're not necessarily invariant under the rest of the group. This might not give me a semi-conjugacy on the whole group. Okay. Uh, so we're going to use this to, well, somehow we have to use rigidity. I haven't used rigidity yet. Right. Okay, so we're going to use rigidity now. Okay, to conclude that rho of A is actually hyperbolic. Okay, and this is sort of the paradigm example of like what goes on in the proof here. So how, do, how am I supposed to use rigidity? So rigidity is the statement that if I deform my action, it, in particular if I continuously deform it, all I've done is a semi-conjugacy. I haven't changed it at all. So if I want to use that fact, I better write down some specific deformations, particularly if I could make a deformation where I knew at the end rho of A was hyperbolic, then I would have won because I know, oh, that's semi-conjugate to the original. You must have been hyperbolic to begin with. Okay. So let's build a deformation. Explicit deformation rho t with rho 0 equal to rho and rho 1 of a hyperbolic. Okay. Rigidity will mean that rho 1 was conjugate to rho 0, so it was semi-conjugate to rho 0, and uh, if my new one is minimal, or actually if it's anything, uh, if rho 1 of A happens to just have two fixed points, okay, anything semi-conjugate to it has to have actually fewer six fixed points, um, and that will be enough to, to, to let me conclude um, that this guy is actually conjugate to the original one. So since rho zero was minimal. Okay. If this is a lot of bookkeeping, don't worry about it. We're gonna build a deformation to write to make rho of A hyperbolic. We'll make A hyperbolic. And uh, trust me that if you just do the bookkeeping, that'll mean it originally was, because that's what rigidity says. Rigidity says you can't change anything. Okay, how do you deform an action of a group when you don't know what the action is? It's only a mystery. Uh, I need some kind of recipe. Okay, so here we are on our surface. Okay, and I know very well what's happening on this subsurface. So let me chop my surface along this curve. Okay, into two parts. One where I understand the action. Here's my A and B again. It looks like that picture. And on here, I have no idea what's going on on the circle. Okay, so I better, I, I really have no choice of what to do. I, 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 I have no information. There's nothing I can write down that says deform this in this way. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to think of chopping along this curve as decomposing my surface into two uh, subsurfaces or my fundamental group into two uh, subgroups, right? And uh, this says, what, if I just do Van Kampen, this says that uh, pi 1 of my surface is an amalgamated free product of A and B along, if this curve is C, the subgroup generated by C. Okay. So I'm going to build a deformation 
rho t, so that rho t restricted to b, I don't know what's going on, I'll just say it keeps doing the same thing, okay, on b no matter what. And then I can use the fact that I know what the action looks like on A to change things how I want it to eventually make A hyperbolic. Okay, rho t uh, restricted to A uh, will be clever, but as long as it satisfies um, that uh, this central curve Okay, is, uh, is the action of it is never changed, then this glues together and gives me a representation of the whole surface group. Okay, so the upshot is this decomposition says, do whatever you want here, if you don't change the action here, you can keep it fixed on this whole half. Okay. Um, we can actually be a little sloppier than that. Okay. Suppose that I did this and I wasn't quite in luck, I defined some deformation and it didn't quite satisfy that I always kept this particular curve doing the same thing, but instead maybe it was conjugate by some f, some homeomorphism of the circle. Where ft is a continuous path. Okay, well then I'd be out of luck, it wouldn't match up. Uh, oh, but if I know what Ft is, I can change this. And I'm going to just conjugate this one. And this will glue up again. Okay, so this is actually going to be our strategy. And that'll finish step one. Step one is somehow the hardest step, so that's the most of our work for today. Okay, so how, what am I going to do here? All right, so I know that the action of these guys is semi-conjugate to this picture. Okay. So rho restricted, rho not or rho restricted to A uh, is semi-conjugate to our geometric picture. Maybe I'll just call it star and point over here. So what does this mean? This means that it's, basic, it's obtained by taking points here, so map H that takes points and, and it's discontinuous, it replaces them by intervals. So it looks kind of like that picture that we had there. But now I have some more information, namely what C is doing. It has some fixed points. It might just have one. It might have a lot. I don't know. OK. There's row naught of C. It has some fixed points. But over here, it has no fixed points in the region where A and B have their fixed sets. So there's A. There's B. Okay, so this tells me how to make A hyperbolic. I'm just going to define a map, a continuous family of maps that takes these intervals to points. Okay, so let HT for T in 0, 1, okay, be homeomorphisms of the circle okay. uh, that are the identity on this region that I don't really want to touch because I don't want to mess up uh, row naught of C very much. So let's say they're the identity on this yellow bit. Okay. Identity on the yellow part, okay, and so that as t goes to zero, uh, goes to one, okay, these two red regions get collapsed to points. Okay, and don't do 
anything fishy, just do it in the very natural way, where uh, here I'll draw you a movie, this is time zero, at, here's the time one circle, just kind of, you know, cone these off. Okay, so that's this region as time goes on. Great. And these ones just expand them reasonably. Okay. And define uh, change rho on A, uh, okay, just to be the conjugate of this by rho t. I have my inverses on the right side. So this is fine. It has an inverse for t in 0, 1. Okay. This will limit to uh, homeo to a homeomorphism that's semi-conjugate to rho by the map that, the continuous map that collapses this to a point. Okay. So this is reasonable to write down for t in 0, 1. And a limit on each generator, say, um, for t equal to 1. Okay, so that's a precise way to say, do a continuous thing that's going to squish these to points. Okay, so this is now semi-conjugate, but not necessarily conjugate. Okay. However, if I look at what rho t of c is doing under this map, I haven't changed anything over here. I'm only changing things a small amount in the area where rho is rho c is translating points to the right by a lot. Okay, so you can just check that C continues at all times to move all these points a definitive distance to the right. Okay, so it literally is, I haven't changed anything about its fixed set or what direction it's moving points here. I just replaced this interval with another one where it's still moving points to the right. That's a conjugate picture. So this is always conjugate to rho naught of C which is exactly what we needed it to do, okay? So, this gives a well-defined deformation. Okay. okay. So hopefully that's clear that you could fill in the details of how to justify this. This is a good, that's the end of uh, step one. We have made a deformation where in the end, uh, A no longer has a bunch of fixed points uh, that are repelling and a bunch that look like they're attracting. I've really taken these down to a single point. Okay, so I made a uh, row of A hyperbolic. This is my end picture. And this is somehow the key observation. Once you sort of know what's happening on some piece of the surface, okay, you can start explicitly writing down ways to deform the action to get the behavior you want, and then say, well, it was rigid. It must have been like that all along. Okay. Um, yeah. The new picture of that, the blue curves are non separating. Does it make any difference if we choose a blue and red curves are separating curves? Uh, yeah, because then their commutator won't be a separating curve, and I can't play this game. So I really wanted to pick a standard generating set so I knew exactly what I was working with. So this is not, I mean, this is probably not the only way to prove the theorem. The general strategy is we're going to say what simple closed curves do. And we're using non-separating ones because this is an easy one relator presentation. This thing tells us the Euler number. It's sort of a very clear setup to work with. But there might be some approach to sort of understanding what's happening on separating curves. Exactly. Um, yeah. Your answer, I don't think they're meaning to have word that there. Is there any generalization of your strategy for other one related groups? Yeah, no. Well, I mean, sort of there's a generalization, but you need to, you know, th this is really using that you're an amalgamated free product. 
it's less about one related groups and more about that you're an amalgamated free product or we'll see a version in one second that works for HNN extensions. And so this is sort of what we're getting our hands on with like being like, oh, we can use an explicit path because, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm tempted, I bet, I bet we can be done in a good 15 minutes. So instead of taking a break, maybe we should just go through and then end at 5.30. So, and I think it's good to keep, keep momentum. But other, other questions before we sort of kill steps two and three? Okay. So make a number assumption that kind of gives you a nice picture right away. You know, step one takes 20 pages instead of like one board. So, and a lot of machinery that builds more sophisticated ways, not to say like where are the uh, fixed points, but when you have potentially periodic points and they interact in different ways to say where they go, uh, we have to kind of build a whole theory to track that. Okay, so uh, let me summarize step one. This was the statement that some generator I can make it AI if I want, is acting by a hyperbolic in the source sync sense, uh, a hyperbolic homeomorphism of the circle. Okay, step two. Not only is one generator good, uh, everything is good. So here's the proposition. For all gamma, a simple closed curve on your surface, or oh, let's say non-separating. Okay. Rho of gamma is hyperbolic. Okay. So now you're, once you prove this, you're really looking like the PSL2R discrete faithful representation. Okay. Okay. So the proof follows from okay. uh, two parts. One, which we'll actually prove. Uh, the statement that if you have two curves that intersect once. Okay, so if uh, A and B satisfy, not necessarily generators, just anything, uh, that they're intersection number one. And what do I mean by that? I mean actually, because we're actually dealing with the fundamental group in a specific presentation for this, I mean that as based curves. Okay, so technically you have to say based curves. Uh, their intersection number is one. So up to a homeomorphism of the surface fixing the base point, they look like this. Okay. So if you have a nice picture like this, if you have two curves with intersection number one, then, uh, oh, and rho of A is hyperbolic, then it propagates. Rho of B is also hyperbolic. Okay, so this says that once I've got one curve, I can get another one, okay. And if you want to say this process is enough to get them all, okay, then you need some statement about, uh, you know, that this relation where you're equivalent, if you look like this, forms a single equivalence class among simple closed curves. So this is kind of connectedness of a certain curve complex. So if you study mapping class groups, uh, this is sort of a standard modification of the 
of the types of arguments that you show to say the usual curve complex is connected or the pants complex is connected or the arc complex is connected or we were using a based curve complex to say you can go like from this guy to this guy and end up in this kind of move end up getting anywhere. Okay. So I won't prove that, uh, but I will prove this because it's another, uh, uh, if you're rigid, uh, then this happens. Okay, so for now on, it's a standing assumption that my action is rigid and minimal, um, and this is what we'll conclude. Okay. So it's the same strategy as here. If I have, if I know A is hyperbolic, and B looks like this, I want to define an explicit deformation that will make B eventually hyperbolic. So for one, we use another family uh, that I like to call bending deformations. Uh, because this is, I mean, this is in the, in the, in the classical theory of quasi-Fuchsian groups. Um, you can think of a quasi-Fuchsian surface as a Fuchsian one bent along a geodesic lamination. This is sort of Thurston's terminology for how to deform a representation into PSL2R into PSL2C. But the idea it works for representations into any group. Okay, so let me define what this is. So if uh, uh, given a representation of a surface group into uh, homie of the circle or actually any topological group. Mm -hmm. And a pair of curves like the ones I just drew. So here is my and here is A. Okay. Uh, bending of rho along A. Okay. Um, is the following. It's a representation or a family. path of representations rho t uh, defined by um, rho t of b is equal to rho of b but you're going to compose it with uh, some element depending on a okay what you need is to choose a path in the centralizer of A. Uh, in the centralizer of row A. Mm -hmm. Row T of A is not going to do anything. Okay. And if I cut my surface here and call this part of the fundamental group B, like before, row restricted to B, row T restricted to B is just the same as row. And the reason I wanted this to be in the centralizer of A is that when I put these two things into a commutator, I get the same as the commutator of A and B. So by my little remark before, this all glues together to give a nice actual representation of the surface group. The relator is satisfied. Okay, so let me just give you the heuristic of the proof of one. Okay, proof idea of one. Okay, is I know that A or rho of A is hyperbolic by assumption, so it's got an attracting fixed point and a repelling fixed point in this kind of dynamics. Okay. 
it sits inside a one parameter family. Anything like this sits inside a, actually a one parameter family of homeomorphisms of the circle. If you imagine this by conjugating it actually into PSL2R as something like, you know, lambda 0, 0, 1 over lambda as a matrix with this kind of dynamics, then you can vary lambda. Uh, uh, and you'll get a one parameter family of homeomorphisms. family, meaning a real, like, R subgroup, a flow, so everything commutes, okay, with, uh, for at least at the integer times, a n is rho of a to the n. Okay, so you think this is, rho, rho a is moving points some definitive distance, you're taking the flow that's continuously moving points from there to there. Okay. Okay. All right, and here's a fake proof that with a bunch of work you turn into a real proof. Okay, so I don't know what B is, okay, but there's a bending deformation. Okay, so we don't know B, but do a bending deformation. Okay, replacing B with, or replacing row of B uh, with this. I'm supposed to do a, a sub t for some amount of time. Any amount of time is fine. This is all a continuous deformation, and then compose that with B. Okay. Okay, and do this for t that's like super, 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 super big. Okay. All right, so what's this going to do? Uh, it's going to take like the complement of this region to a tiny neighborhood of that point, right? And then I'll apply B and I won't mess it up too much. That's going to make it look like B takes the complement of a tiny region to, to a single point somewhere. Okay, and conversely, the inverse, uh, I'm supposed to apply B inverse, it'll like move some points somewhere, but then I'll do a giant negative power of A, and this will give me a very strong kind of repeller. Okay, so uh, this is why it's a fake proof. That looks really hyperbolic. Okay. And then the work is promoting this into uh, a real proof, um, which I think in the interest of time, I won't do all the details. But you genuinely are just clever with one of these bending deformations. Okay. And that's, you know, that's sort of see the morally the story of what's going on. Okay, so that sketch proves step two. And I want to sort of finish with the end of the end. We got one hyperbolic curve. You propagate that to get all your curves hyperbolic. And finally, step three is that the axes of these hyperbolic elements, or what I mean is the attracting and repelling fixed points, of uh, these non-separating simple closed curves, are in exactly the same cyclic order as they are for the geometric PSL2R representation as a discrete faithful representation to PSL2R. Okay. And that's a ton of information and that's actually enough as you probably won't find surprising, that's enough to conclude 
rho is conjugate or semi-conjugate if you did forgot it was minimal to such a representation. Okay, so a quick way to do this is to use this kind of information to show the Euler class is, is actually 2g minus 2 and then quote Matsumoto's uh, a theorem of Matsumoto, the one basically that I cited before, but you can also do this with more pain by hand. Be like, well, if every curve is in the right place and I know how you conjugate one simple closed curve to another and see where it goes, you sort of can tell what the surface group has to do. Uh, hopefully this is eminently believable once you get this much of a, everything is in the right place in the right picture. Okay. So let me just cartoon how step three goes. We do this in a systematic way, but let's do proof by example. And the strategy is before is these bending deformations. Okay. So let's consider some curves that we understand with intersection number one. So my usual or maybe zero. Let's do let's do a triple of curves. Here's B, here's A, and I don't know, here's some C that doesn't intersect them. And the geometric picture says that they're attracting and repelling fixed points. I haven't oriented these, but if you orient them in the correct way, you'll see like, I don't know, A and B, these should intersect. So that's like an attractor and a repeller for B. There's, there's no axes because there's no disks. It's just the circle, but let's use that to summarize. And then C doesn't intersect, so it's sort of somewhere over here with a plus and a minus somewhere. Okay. Okay, so I'm going for this, and let's suppose for contradiction that I did not have this right, correct cyclic order. Okay, so yeah, let me get, let me get more space here. Oop. Okay. So that's what we want. Okay. And if we had, I don't know, something different, like, uh, I don't know, maybe A is like this, plus and minus, as we had before. Uh, maybe, maybe C is disjoint, it was good. Okay, but I don't know, B was doing something bad, and the repelling point was not in this interval between a fixed point of C and one of A, but like somewhere over here. Okay. Actually, uh, sure, that should be fine. Okay, I cooked up a particularly simple example, but uh, now I'm going to use this one because sh anything should be possible. If something goes wrong, you can always choose a bending deformation that works. Okay. Okay, so I want to say that if this configuration happened, I could make a bending deformation that would change this configuration and therefore not be a conjugate picture. Okay, so let's do a bending in A, where AT is a one parameter family, right? That, uh, I don't know, uh, is like we had before. So it satisfies. Uh, if I do it for time n, I get a power of rho of a. Okay. And I'm supposed to looking at this bending deformation by definition, okay, rho t does not change what c is doing. Okay, rho t does not change what a is doing, and what it does to b is, uh, what am I supposed to do? First do a, t, and then do b. Okay, so let's see, what's the new, here the repelling fixed point of b was in a bad spot. 
What happens after I do it with this deformation? Well, the repelling point of this is like the attracting point of its inverse. So let's try and understand rho t b inverse. That's doing a t inverse, and then, uh, but first doing b inverse. Okay. So b inverse will do something, but if t is extremely, extremely big, then this will send almost all the points in the circle to a tiny little neighborhood of uh, uh, the repeller of A. Okay, so I apply B inverse, not sure what happens, but then everything goes very close to the repeller of A. So the attracting fixed point of this must be near the repeller of A. So the attracting fixed point, uh, the hyperbolic attractor, or the repeller for rho t of b must be near the, the repeller of a. Okay, so that says that after my deformation, I'll do it in, right, in, in white, the new b is acting uh, something, well, I'm not sure, I haven't figured out where its attracting fixed point is, but the b minus is somewhere over here. Okay, which is in a totally different combinatorial configuration. Okay, and that can't happen if rho was rigid. That I've changed the semi-conjugacy class of this representation. I've changed the cyclic order of points. Okay, so this contradicts rigidity. So the idea is if anything is not as it should be, you can name a bending deformation that changes the combinatorial configuration. And sort of the miracle hard thing to believe is if you take this one and you do every possible bending deformation, you might move these points around, but you'll never change the order they're in. That's a good exercise to check, um, uh, to convince yourself that there's some hope of the strategy working. I, I did the sanity check like a hundred times, I think, because I kept not believing it. But, but it works. Uh, that's, that's sort of the miracle. I mean, it has to be true. These, these representations are rigid. Okay, so this seemed like an ad hoc argument, but you can formalize it uh, in a way that sort of treats all the cases you need pretty s systematically and quickly. Um, and that's enough to get the axes in the right place and conclude that in, you know, you're basically reconstructing the topology of the surface. Okay. Um, and that's why you, I really came from a, from, a, from a hyperbolic structure on a surface or from, a, from this, this sort of circle at infinity action that you had before. Uh, that, that curves sort of remember where the surface is and what it's doing. Okay. And that, modulo the details I did not tell you, uh, proves the theorem and I think that's a good place to end. So, thanks.